Copyright, University of Auckland, all rights reserved. And I'll just pull this up as well. Actually, before I do that, I might just show this. I'll go into it. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, it's always a great pleasure, and particularly to see students I know and students I don't know. Um, and I also want to acknowledge, you know, I'm going to be looking at incarceration in New Zealand, and I, I recognise that there are people in the room that have far more experience than me around this, and I want to acknowledge and respect uh, the hard experience of their own journey. Before we start on to that, I also want to just bring to people's attention um, around the... I don't know why it's not wanting to show. There, that's why it's not wanting to show. Um, around the rally on Tuesday, October the 21st, the Living, the living Wage Rally. Uh, there's a number of us speaking at that, and um, it would be very good to have everyone there. It doesn't want to show that, so I'm just going to go back to the Lexton computer, which it did, it did seem to want to show. So let's have a look how I'm going to do this. And for those of you who are a little bit more familiar with um, the way that I often show it is that I often have a number of things going with me doing the speaking and with um, the slides telling another story, and often a number of stories. So I'm wanting those things to sort of go at the same time. Um, in, my, in terms of my background, I'm a sociologist. I have a very significant interest around criminal justice system, and I'm also the director of Napa Te Maramatanga, which is the National Centre uh, of Excellence, uh, the National Māori Centre of Research Excellence. And, and this is an area uh, that is also important to us as we go forward, both looking at our great successes uh, and the huge opportunities and challenges that face Māori but also recognising around what happens at the periphery, what happens in the margins. If we are truly to change our society, if we are to work with transform, transformative intent, we must work at the margins as well. If you're actually going to change society, you can't, it cannot just work from the top. In fact, it will not work from the top. You get transformative change from working at the margins and from the bottom. And just, a, again, a, a recognition of that. So... I've got a whole lot of things going on here, and I'm wanting to sort of start with a number of things. One is around that statistic that we all know. You know, if we think about any sort of social indicator, any statistic that we're most familiar with, you know, if you ask it, if you go, the first one is usually how many sheep we've got, and we usually get that wrong. We usually say how many sheep we've got from back in the day, when we had 60 million sheep in this country, a lot less sheep now, only 20 million. Um, but that's sort of the first statistic that we know. The second one often is, that Māori make up over 50% of those that are incarcerated in this country. Now that's that, that's that statistic that we all know. And I want us to think about that straight away, about what this does when you have a statistic that you don't interrogate, a statistic that you just let sit there, a statistic that you just think is normal, natural, like the rivers that flow, like the trees that grow. The fact is it's not a natural condition, it's a socially constructed condition. And again, we must recognise our power, that if it has been socially constructed, we can deconstruct it. It is not a matter of nature, it's a matter of social conditioning. So I want to think about that. I'm actually just going to slow this, what I've just shown you what you've got here is, because I'm talking about stories of confinement, what I want us to recognise is that incarceration is just one form of confinement. That those that, who are most likely to be confined in our institutions presently, that the prison is, is very rarely their first form of confinement. And their, their form of confinement is either through care and protection, through SIFs, through youth justice, through a whole range of things, through foster families. And we can see that historically, this is part of New Zealand's story. In many ways, it's part of New Zealand's story that is largely untold. And I do want to tell some of that story today. Before I do it, I want to look really closely at that notion around over-representation some of the problems with using that term in a way that doesn't interrogate it. So if you think, you know, in some of the courses that I teach, I'm stunned at how many times in one lecture I would use the word over-representation when I'm talking about particularly Māori and Pacific people um, being over-represented in virtually every negative social indicator. So we've got to be careful when we use these terms and how we use them. 
So while it is often descriptively correct, it is a less than useful designation because it is monolithic in concept and practice. It tends to depict the prefix, the over, is unproblematic, hence normalising it, naturalising it. And most importantly, it renders invisible the social structures uh, and mechanisms that create it, that engender it, that produce it. So over-representation becomes another tool of confinement in that it speaks to and confirms an existing situation of not only those that are currently incarcerated, but also to an enduring cycle of incarceration. An enduring cycle of incarceration. It's not that 50% of the people who are incarcerated now are the same 50% that were incarcerated 10 years ago. Unfortunately, too many of them are turning through. But it speaks to this constant sort of churn, constant cycle, constant numbers of young people going through, going in, going out. So this sort of churning sort of sense around what that cycle of incarceration means. It describes the systemic churn that ensures, but it also then, as I said, normalises, naturalises in some way, is then seen nearly as sort of a particular group's destiny. So I have argued in other places around, is prison a matter of dissent, given that, disproportion that disproportionality? Is it some form of sort of genealogical inheritance? Or is it related to dissent, to resistance, an act of resistance against mainstream societal norms that have largely ensured the systemic frustration of aspirations, particularly of Māori and Pacific peoples, but of the poor, of those that live under conditions of deprivation and scarcity. So while I've really struggled, and I continue to struggle, to come up with a word uh, that replaces over-representation. I remain aware of how closely the word and its use and the experience associated with it speak to a high level of social constraint and blocked opportunities. And it's something that I want you to think about you know, when you use that term. Many of you will use it in your work, will use it in your writing, will use it in your essay forms. Think about it every time you use it. What does it actually mean to use it? What does it speak about the structures in our society? Now, when we're looking through at these, these um, images that we've got here, as I said, when I'm talking about stories of confinement, whilst they usually, uh, when we think about confinement, we largely consider the prison, I'm wanting us to recognise the sort of whakapapa of confinement, that the young people, you know, my work, I spend a lot of time in prisons, um, mainly at, the, at Woody, at the women, Auckland Regional uh, Women's Prison, uh, more recently also going uh, to the prison, um, the women's prison in Wellington, Arahata. But when uh, I'm working with the women in those prisons, very few, in fact, none of the women that I've worked with weren't confined prior to coming to prison, weren't confined in some way, weren't in youth justice residence, they were all in youth justice residence, nearly without, uh, you know, 80% of all young people who find themselves in prison at the time of conviction, so those are 16 to 18 year olds that find themselves in prison, not in a youth section, in prison at 16 years old, 16 to 18 year old, 80% 80 of all of those young people are in SIF's care at the time of conviction. So are in SIF's care. So who is the parent at the time of their conviction? The state is the parent. The state is the parent. And for most cases, the state has been the parent of those young people's lives five, 10, 12 years. A lot of the young uh, women I work with have been in, with the state as parent from the time they're three or four years old. So again, to sort of think about those sorts of, you know, think about confinement. And think about confinement in a range of other ways in New Zealand as well, in terms of the confinement of that frustration of opportunity of aspirations. What does that mean? What does it mean in the lived experience of young people? What does it mean that I can be speaking to a 16 year old and we're trying to find a, a good memory for a bit of NCEA writing uh, that we're doing? And that at 16, she is unable to find any good memory. Now, what does that mean? So. Let's just think about the history of New Zealand and its confinement, and particularly the confinement of young people. 
between 1915, I know some of you will have heard this, that have come to lectures of mine before, between 1950 and 1990, 100,000 children were incarcerated in New Zealand. 100,000 children. And those children were in, from the ages, those were all under 17 years old. In 1975, sort of, and that was an absolute direct response to policy. This was a policy that thought that children needed to be both in care and protection and needed short, sharp exercises to pull them in to line. And so there were a whole range, and I'll talk about some of those institutions in a moment, but there were a whole range of these institutions. 100,000 children. 100,000 children. This is one of our stories that we just don't tell. So David Cohen, in his book on uh, little criminals, I think it's a really important history, and I would uh, ask you to look at it. Uh, David Cohen, Little Criminals, where he looks at uh, where he looks at particularly one of these uh, institutions, which is uh, a Puni boys' home. So that hundred thousand direct response to policy, 1950 to 1990, hundred thousand children. Well, that's in itself enough. Average age, uh, 1975, the average age was 15. But as I said, you had from 11-year-olds right up to under 17-year-olds. Uh, where do you think they went from there? What do you think is the outcomes for many of those young children? The fact is that the women that I work with now are the children and the grandchildren of those children. And I'm not saying that in a figurative or metaphorical sense. They are actually the children and the grandchildren of those that went through during that time. Now, this is not, this is exactly how it moves. So let's just sort of take a step back and think, and I started off with these sort of the, the social statistic that we all know. How do we make sense in New Zealand of the fact that we've seen a crime rate declining following international trends for the last 20 years? So we've seen a crime rate declining for the last 20 years, and again, following international trends, and in that same period, we have seen our prison rate, our prison incarceration rate, increase threefold. How do we make sense of that? It seems that it's an obvious contradiction. Others would argue, no, it's working. See, it's working. Crime rate's declining because we're putting them all in prison. Some have argued that we don't have a crime problem in this country, that we have a prison problem in this country. We have another prison that has been uh, built at the moment. It's nearly finished. It's huge. Uh, and it, we will create, when that prison is finished, which is out by Woody, right next door to the women's prison, right next door to the youth justice residence, we will have in New Zealand, for the first time, an incarceration precinct in this country. And how far it is away from us? It's 15 k's away from where we're sitting now. Where we're sitting now, this time, next year, you'll have a men's prison that will be moving towards filling up. They will close down one of the other prisons down the line that's old and no longer fit for purpose, whatever that purpose may be. Uh, but we will have a prison there, very large prison. Any of you flying into uh, the airport, into Auckland Airport, and if you're sitting on the left-hand side of the plane and you're doing a Monaco City uh, approach into the airport, look to your left and you'll see that complex. Uh, you'll see the, the women's prison, you'll see the much, much larger new uh, male prison there, and you'll see the youth centre right next to it. And for a lot of the women that I work with, they virtually did just come across the fence. They came from YJ, Youth Justice, into, uh, into Woody. And they often point to it. You know, when we're talking, they'll always sort of be pointing into the air, knowing where it's there. I mean, first there was sort of, particularly among some of my younger women, there was sort of general glee and jubilation when the male prison was announced. It was like, I said, you know, it's not a boys' high school. There won't be dancers. Um, but there was just a sort of sense around what it meant just having the men that close. Uh, they put a big sort of thing in between because I think that there's also a recognition of that. So when we think about a in, you know, statistics and incarceration statistics, what do we have to recognise? We have to recognise that what do these statistics mean to us? One, that they're devastating for the victims of crime, and I recognise that and acknowledge a high levels of victimisation in this country. They're devastating for individuals, they're devastating for whānau, they're devastating for communities. Uh, you know, if we look at our incarceration rates, when we recognise that our incarcerates mean that in the countries that we most like to um, compare ourselves with, developed capitalist 
nations. We're second when we, when we compare ourselves with those countries. Second, are we the second most dangerous country in the world? Many of you will hear that. Again, how do we understand it? How do we make sense of a society like ours, a society that has abundance, uh, that we have an incarceration rate in the way that we do? So I'm wanting us, I'm not going to, I've got a whole lot of things around that that I could talk about, I won't now. But one of the things I do want you to think about is rather than thinking about this as a crime problem, have a greater focus on this as a social harm problem. And to think about social harm and the way that we need to work towards the eradication of it, the mitigation of it, and what is social harm? Social harm is poverty, social harm is deprivation, social harm is racism, social harm is stigmatisation. If we address those issues, and if we address those issues from the earliest onset, I believe that we would have a very different incarceration rate than what we have now. The actual fact of seeing it as a crime problem means that, again, we see it as an individual issue and, and, and become blind to the structural and sy the systemic issues. The other thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of that, that use of over-representation again is this um, a recognition of it as a Māori problem. As a Māori woman, I recognise it as that we have, here I'm speaking as Māori, that Māori have an obligation moral and cultural to intervene in our communities. Unfortunately, the word intervention has largely been used as a state tool against Māori and other marginalised groups. But we do have a responsibility to intervene. We do have to recognise the violence in our communities, but we also have to work both at that level, in terms of at the, the whānau level, at the community level, but also at that systemic structural um, issue as well. And the other thing that I want to bring home to you is that whilst we often see this as the Māori problem, that that in itself doesn't really give us a good sense of the picture. If it was just solely a Māori problem, then my expectation would be that when I went into the prisons, that there'd be a lot of Māori in there, and there is, and that they would come from all backgrounds. They come from all backgrounds, it's a Māori issue, and Māori are in every socioeconomic group. But what is very clear from any time that you spend um, within prison situations is that people largely come from the same backgrounds and have very familiar characteristics. It's nearly relentless, in fact, in terms of getting that type of data. So what we're seeing is a very high-level churn through a very, a relatively small slice uh, of society, which also does sort of indicate that there is some that different forms of intervention, and I'm, I'll speak to those right at the end, um, could make a very significant uh, difference. So I've already spoken about David Cohen's book, and as I said, he, his book really points to the fact that this confinement of children in, in New Zealand society is largely an invisible story. Right from the early days of contact and settlement, there have been forms of confinement. But as I said, it was really in that particular period from the sort of 1950s, and we can see the Hun report, we can see a whole range of things that put policy into place uh, around dealing with the problem of children. That, that 100,000 children, mostly Māori, right at the beginning of the 1950s, it was a pretty even split between Pākehā, poor Pākehā children and poor Māori kids. By 1975, it was about 80% were Māori kids. Um, and you're starting to see the Pacific, particularly Pacific boys, not Pacific girls, but Pacific boys, uh, also coming through. And there was the sense that, they were, that there was a need to lock them away, that that was actually addressing a societal need. Many of the children that were held in these youth residence training facilities uh, still churn through the prisons today. The 54, the 55, the 56, they're still churning through. Uh, so you, you do see those that have got that long-term churn and you've got all of these young ones, as I said, the children and the children, uh, the, and the children's children coming through. David Cohen's work on, on a Puni boy's home, so Puni's just outside of Wellington, it's just up uh, in the valley. He himself was a resident at 13 uh, in 1975. He went there for a very short period of time. In many ways, he was an anomaly. 
Uh, he, was, he was from a poor family, but he's from a poor Pākehā family. He went through relatively quickly, but even the short time he went there obviously stayed with him as one of those sort of searing experiences. And in his book, he weaves the sort of insider experiences, the archival research, he does a lot of policy uh, analysis, and he draws on narrative and participant uh, accounts of that, of that experience. So by 1975, sort of seen as the apex in terms of our confinement of children, you had that Apuni, Apuni's Boys Home at that time was just one of 21 similar institutions throughout the country. The average age of children sent, who were confined, who were incarcerated, were 13, though they were both younger and older children. Uh, they were sent there for a whole range of reasons, care and protection, as I said, so they were sent there because they were in homes where there was violence, there was homes where there were social problems, there was homes where sometimes they were just poor. There's one of the narratives in the book um, he was from a family of 13. They picked him up largely because, as far as he could understand, they were poor. He hadn't been in trouble. His father uh, had lost a job recently. They were struggling. The family was struggling financially. And he said, as far as he could understand, he was picked up because they were poor. Um, so you had kids there for care and protection, but you also had those that were in for status offending, underage drinking. You had uh, those that had run away from home. Again, why do kids run away from home? Why do girls run away from home? Why do boys run away from home? That's the reason to incarcerate them. There's some fascinating um, stories and histories actually around runaways, particularly around girl runaways, um, that become criminalised by trying to escape their victimisation. Uh, so just the point of running away and the fact that the runaway is, is nearly always seen as, as sexually promiscuous, that in many cases young girls have been incarcerated through no criminal uh, forms of offending as well, but the actual victimisation has criminalised them. There's also a number of children there that were in for criminal offending, some of the quite serious offending. A, a report commissioned by the Ministry of Social Development on the Kohatiri uh, Institute, which was uh, established as a rehabilitation centre for young male offenders, mainly in the 14 to 17 year old group, um, and you can go and look at this in terms of historical impact reports, which looks at, amongst other things, abuse that occurred uh, within these residences. There was a hierarchy of violence that occurs when you put the 11-year-olds uh, with 16-year-olds, with where you put in kids that are in there for care and protection and kids that are in there for a whole lot of problems. What do you think falls out in that system? What type of structure occurs? And certainly when you read these reports, uh, you see that all of those things are occurring. Many of the residents that were in the boys' home had already learnt, learnt and complied with a strict code of silence. They were unlikely to inform on other residents or staff due to fear of reprisal and the stigma of breaking the code. So we see a whole range of particular codes that we largely um, associate with prison codes, convict codes, already being well established within the boys' homes, within the institutions that are there. The power relations amongst the residents was highly hierarchical and bullying was pervasive. The report noted that while a culture of bullying fluctuated over times, it seems that it was most prevalent during and after the late 1970s. The difference in age of residents meant there was considerable disparity in terms of experience and size. In simple terms, it meant that the smaller residents were more vulnerable to larger residents and practices to protect smaller and younger residents were largely unsuccessful. So there's a whole range of, of things that were going here, and I'm not going to speak about it today, but a Puni Boys Home is often seen as very central in terms of gang formation in this country, particularly with mongrel mob, but certainly not exclusively with mongrel mob. And there have been a number of ones where they've spoken about the role that the, the Boys Home played. So some have argued that actually we, that the gang formation that we saw, particularly the um, extension of the gang formation in the 1970s, is largely a result of social policy. So I don't want to spend too long on it because I'm hoping that some of you will, will look at this, but what happens within these institutions of confinement? What happens in terms of of around those aspirations, around those opportunities, around issues of trust and mistrust. What do we learn within an institution? So think about, you're all in an institution, we're all institutionalised here, 
to a degree, but we have. This is not a total institution. They're not, you know, we, we spend part of our life here, not all of our life here. We have lives that occur outside of it. But when you're in a boy's home, when you're in a form of confinement, when you're in a girl's home, that is the total institution. All experiences occur within it. And it, you know, in terms of its socialisation, it's, ex it's extremely high in terms of informing. What we know now, we still, we still hold today the earlier that you have an engagement with the criminal justice system, the longer the life course affects. And again, we see this in this terms of confinement. You know, and I always make the argument, if I went to prison today because I embezzled my employer, I would go to prison, I would do my time, I would get out, very unlikely I would return. If I find myself, if I had a very different experience and I was confined at the age of 10 or 11, if I was moved from foster home to foster home, on average in the 1960s and the early 70s, a child put into care would, be, would probably in the first year of care be in five different homes in three different regions. One child, first year of care. We're doing better than that now, but we're not doing a whole lot better. There is still an incredible high level of mobility of those that are in confinement. Less than, than in the 70s, but we still, we still see that today. So we can see that homes, institution, forms of confinement, hardly therapeutic. We've got some pictures up here of Lake Alice, and I do want to just speak very briefly around Lake Alice. So many of you will know that Lake Alice was a psychiatric institute an institution where adults and children were held and they were subject to a number of, tr of treatments, uh, one of them around um, ECG. So the use, uh, ECT, sorry, as a, uh, was used there. For adults it was used as a form, so this is electroconvulsive therapy. For adults it was used as a form of therapy and, it, and again it's still used today. Um, and I don't wish to speak to that. For children who were at Lake Ellis, it was used explicitly as a form of punishment. And in fact, children who were subject to ECT at Lake Ellis, were, the instructions were before um, the treatment started, they were told that it was a punishment, actually told. And this was because the, uh, the, the chief child psychiatrist, Dr. Selwyn Leakes, uh, believed that, in fact, he didn't just believe, he was absolutely convinced that ECT could be used as an aversion therapy, uh, and here I'm quoting him, a way of putting wayward young patients back on the straight and narrow. The average age of a child, overwhelmingly Māori, at Lake Alice, was 11 years old. 11 years old. Again, part of the New Zealand story that we don't know. And again, the children of those children and their children who went to Lake Alice are going through our prison system now. And again, I'm not using that metaphorically, I'm not using that figuratively, I'm using that actually. That the young people that I see in there, their parents, in some cases their grandparents, were in Lake Alice and were subject to it. Now, uh, Dr. Leakes, um, the retired High Court judge, Sir Rodney Gallon, was appointed by the government to divide up compensation amongst claimants, reported that, and here I'm quoting, um, uh, the High Court judge. Therapy is punishment. The children were locked away with insane adults and subjected to sexual abuse. He went on to say, I'm satisf satisfied that in the main the allegations which have been made are true and reveal an appalling situation. Statement after statement, in many cases confirmed on interview, refer to systems, patterns of behaviour, punishments inflicted and a way of life imposed which I have no doubt was established and enforced by those in authority. So again, Part of those stories that we don't know, thinking about the different forms of confinement in the society, and it continues. I think we've become much, you know, in terms of this sort of form of what Lake Alice was and what Lake Alice represented, uh, but we still have to recognise, and many of us have seen, see those sort of stories keep coming up, that we are still doing poorly in this area. We've had a green paper, we're now a white paper in terms of vulnerable children. It does mean that it definitely is an area that we are taking seriously, reflecting upon, but there is much work to be done uh, in this area. So I'm not going to talk about the prison and, and the way, uh, the, the role that uh, these forms of confinement had in terms of 
both a form of gang formation, but I do want us to, to think really quickly around the prison in terms of Māori identity, uh, really starting to think about well, the Māori prison identity anyway, thinking about the, the types of structures that increase this churn. Chester Burroughs, um, who is now no longer the Associate Minister for Corrections, said something that I think is really very useful. He said, we often talk about the criminal justice pipeline. And we talk about that, you know, we need to change the pipeline, we need to make sure that young kids are not getting in on the pipeline, all those things. And he said, be very clear, it is not a pipeline, it's a sewer. And I think that is actually something that we do have to reflect about. Once you're on that pipeline, particularly as I said, the younger you get in on it, the ability for you to get off it is very difficult. The state agents, state forms of authority, the way that you, that, that um, sort of takes over one's life is absolutely relentless in terms of systematically producing what it does produce. The high, I've spoken already around sort of victimisation and, and the sort of thing that we have to think about you know, if I go back to that issue around social harm, I think it's absolutely the crux of what we need to be working for and I'm hoping that here I see uh, fellow people of action and that is really addressing these issues of social harm. So what is social harm? So social harm then, much more useful than, use the, than using this, this terminology around crime. This is not to say that crime doesn't happen, it's not to say that people are not victims of crime, obviously they are. But if we address issues of social harm, and if the social harm is a much broader purview of, of looking at it, so that we look at what does it mean in terms of what are the outcomes of living under conditions of poverty? What are the outcomes of living in terms of deprivation? We know it in terms of health, we know it in terms of education, and we know the evidence base is very clear in terms of justice. So we do need, these are ways that we can intervene, we can mitigate this policy that's in place. Um, in 2012, I was the co-chair of the Children's Commissioner's Expert Advisory Group on Solutions to Child Poverty. And one of the things that we recognise there is that actually this country has about as much poverty as it can tolerate. So it's got a high tolerance for children's poverty. We have a poverty rate amongst the elderly of around 3%. Because we don't, you know, there's not a high tolerance for elderly poverty in this country. We have a universal benefit for the elderly. So if you compare it with the US, for example, the US has very high child poverty rates and it has very high elderly poverty rates. New Zealand has low elderly poverty rates. That's a great thing. And that's a very good thing. But it does, talk that, it does show that there are policy levers that can be put into place that create change. Now, one of the things when I was doing the work on child poverty was it was always interesting to me how quickly that you move from when you're discussing child poverty, you know, you're looking at the 260,000, you're looking at the 275,000 children, the 280,000 children who live, um, depending if you're using a 60% median wage, there's a whole range of indicators that you can use for child poverty, but it's very clear what the experience of child poverty is. You don't have to convince school teachers in low decile areas, you don't have to uh, convince GPs frontline, you don't have to convince those that work in hospital that child poverty exists in this country. They see it on a day-to-day -day basis. But one of those issues of when we talked about child poverty was how quickly the discussion moved from child poverty to terrible parenting. Usually between uh, 6 to 30 seconds. So that's an interesting thing that it tells us about New Zealand. Because what it seems to be saying is that we would rather that children lived in, po in poverty than ever reward bad parents. It also seems to show that all oh, these 270,000, 275,000 kids well, have all got bad parents. I've already shown you that most of the, the, the young people I see, the state is the parent when they come into the system. So there's, there's a very high tolerance for child poverty. I think there's been a, a lot of action over the last few years. There's been people from uh, 
who have worked in the poverty space for tens, 20, 30 years, they themselves have seen that there is a change, that we are starting to see attitudinal change in terms of uh, a lower acceptance that poverty, and particularly the child poverty, ex exists um, in our society. But that's a real form of social harm. There are things that you can do, you can determine to do. Countries that have got the lowest uh, child poverty in the country, Scandinavian countries with the lowest child poverty, people always come back and say, yeah, they've got oil and money, they're wealthy, they're homogenous countries. But you've got to think that the, po the policies that Sweden and Denmark put into place, Norway, they put into place in 1946. After the war, they were not wealthy. They were not rich. They were poor. And they made a decision, which you can follow through in terms of their policy, they made a decision, this is the money we've got, how do we want to spend it? And one of the things they determined was to, to invest it in, in early childhood. So that was a decision they made, not a decision made of wealth. They are, there's certainly there's a whole lot of wealth coming through there now, and they're actually, one of their issues is that as they get wealthier, they're starting to see uh, greater levels of disparity. But the policies that they put into place, they put into place immediately after the war when they were not uh, in, a, in, a, in the financial position that they're in now. They made decisions about the type of society they wanted to create, the type of society they wanted to live in, the types of values that they wanted that society to articulate. So again, we have to be clear, we have a lot of corporate welfare in this country. We've seen it particularly uh, post 2008, where we don't call it corporate welfare, but where we've seen corporates be aided and abetted by their poor practices by being rewarded by that in terms of high level government intervention. And there's a rationale and a narrative put forward for why that happens. And yet at this other end, again, you know, we've got we've got working for families. Working families is very interesting in terms of a policy lever because it did make a difference in terms of child poverty rate, but it also is unequal in application. So that the children of those that have got work um, are benefited against those who, by the fact that their parents are beneficiaries, cannot make the same sort of claim. Now, we all know you want to incentivise work, but should it be on the backs of children? You know, is that the policy lever that you want to have? So again, let's really reflect around social harm. If we dealt with social harm in the earlier stages, I think that we would have a very different uh, social landscape uh, that we'd be looking at now. Oh, it's got stuck on that one. Um, the other thing that I want to think is that it's very easy in New Zealand to talk about victims and offenders as if they were two quite separate groups. That we talk about victims as if they were different from offenders both demographically and morally. And of course the world is not that black and white. And if we look at the New Zealand Crime and Safety Survey, it tells us that 50% of all victimisations are experienced by only 6% of New Zealanders. 50% of all victimisations experienced by 6% of all New Zealanders. And that the social and demographic indicators that identify those who are most likely to be victimised are identical to the mar markers for those most likely to be offenders. So the life stories and cultural contacts that we victims and offenders together, often within the same person, make any artificial separation between offenders and victims just that, an artifice and an oversimplification of a complex world. We have extremely, for women coming into the prison system, we have around about 100% victimisation rate. We usually say we have a 90% victimisation rate in terms of women uh, coming into prison. That victimisation rate largely uh, characterised by violence, and particularly sexual violence. Uh, much of that sexual violence occurring at a very young part of the life course. Men going to prison also have very high levels of victimisation, particularly uh, high levels of violent victimisation, again, often occurring at a very early stage of the life course. Our prison population is like prison populations all over the world, in that it is young, predominantly male, and poor, 
about 92 to 93% of the prison population is male, but it is the women where we're seeing the greatest growth. And again, that follows international trends. So we've seen about 287% increase um, in the female incarceration rate over the last 10 years. Costs about $92,000 to keep uh, a man in prison per year. Costs about $108,000 to keep a woman in prison every year. This year we will spend $770 million in custodial, uh, out of, straight out of the budget, vote justice, straight out of the budget, $770 million just on custodial. Not in any other part of corrections, just on custodial. We have about 9,000 prisoners, but we but we process around 20, 21,000 uh, per year. Many people churn back through that prison system uh, due to administrative you know, breaches. So they're released on a range of conditions and they breach the conditions you go back, you do get an extremely high churn. Um, in terms of that high administrative breach churn, overwhelmingly Māori are more likely to go through. So some of you are very aware of the work of Just Speak, some of you will be members of Just Speak, Again, uh, you know, as, as sort of a youth arm of rethinking crime and punishment, where you really, where they looked very closely last year at who goes, you know, who does go to prison. So it's not just that we've got this 50%, and if we look at women, women, the women prison population is 65% of all women in our prison system are Māori, so higher than the rate of men. If we look at women between 16 and uh, 30, 75% of them are Māori. If we look at them between 16 and 21, 92% of them are Māori. So, an indictment of our system that it is normalised and naturalised. It is not interrogated. We recognise it. It's just one of those things that happened. Up until the 1950s, the prison population in New Zealand was overwhelmingly white. So we do see a whole range of effects happening to change that prison population. If we look at indigenous peoples in settler states, the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, uh, we see that, that over-representation, that disproportionality, unbelievably marked. You just go across the ditch and look in Australia. You know, in New Zealand we make up between about 16% of the population. If you look at age profiles, we of course make up a, a larger uh, a larger percentage again in terms of a younger age profile. We look at Australia where you know, you've got less than 3% of the population being Aboriginal. Unbelievable incarceration rates there. Native American incarceration rates in certain states is far higher than African American incarceration rates. Astounding and astonishing as that may be. We have a 100 hour incarceration rate in New Zealand. Presently it's 199 per 100,000. 199 people per 100,000. If we disaggregate that for ethnicity, 700 for Māori, 700 per 100,000. That is what we call it the tipping point. That's about mass incarceration of a particular group. What is mass incarceration? It means where the in communities absolutely feel the effects of having a significant number of their community churning through the prison system. So even you know, if, we, if we disaggregate that data, if we look at the data in the US, of course, it's astonishing. I mean, it's, even though we come second in them, I have to say we're, along, we're way behind that. Uh, they, in terms of African-American incarceration rates, you know, 2,500 per 100,000. Um, but in particular areas, in particular states, we see that very high incarceration rate amongst um, indigenous people. Canada, also an incredible level of disproportionality. So what can we, how do we make sense of it? Uh, and there's been a lot of research done in that. We can see in terms of impacts of processes well before the century. We can see the ongoing accumulation of disadvantage that occurs. So one of the things we often don't think about it is the way, the way that advantage accumulates. Some of you will have heard me say this little statistic, you know, so if we look at this, at this university, um, 75% of our students, and these are new students, students uh, and school leaver students, 75% of them come from 12 schools. 75% of our students come from 12 schools. I was down in the University of Otago last uh, 
last week, and I go back down again there this week, um, they were telling me that actually the majority of their students come from five schools. You know, so they sort of thought we were quite expansive and demographic in terms of our 12 school. That privilege that many of our students at this university, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, I, I, I'd like to see this shared much more equally within, in, within New Zealand. 75% many of our students that come have had uh, education experience that has been characterised by over-resourcing. Characterised by over-resourcing. Or if you're in a school which is over-resourced, you don't think of it about it being over-resourced, you think it's pretty normal. This is what you get. This is what school looks like. We've got schools in South Auckland and West Auckland that don't have geography teachers, that don't have economic teachers, in many cases don't have maths teachers. We've got kids in year 12 and 13 having to do geography and economic classes on their own because they have not been able to get a teacher in three years to come into those schools. New Zealand has a, a high... Uh, it, it has a high quality, low equity education system. What does this mean? It means that we get fabulous outcomes, educational outcomes, for the sector of our society, very low equity, very poor distribution. So we have some of the biggest differences between excellent educational outcomes and the poorest educational outcomes. All of these factors play into what I've seen. Every single one of the young women that I've seen in the prison in the last six years and has come into the prison at 16, has been excluded from the compulsory education system by 13, without an exception. Without an exception. So, I will preach no longer, um, but I'll start thinking, well, what can we do? What can you engage in? Where can it make a, a difference? And these are just a range of things that we can look at. I am very interested around the, the possibilities of justice reinvestment. Some of you may be familiar with justice reinvestment. It, um, and it does mean it is a policy, it does mean you have to put a whole lot of policy levers into place. I've already given you the numbers, 767, 770 million dollars custodial alone in our budget coming out of the, uh, out of the public purse. I've already given you the figures, 92,000 for men, 108,000 for women, actually often more at the, at the youth justice level. That's how much it costs to keep in prison. Imagine what it would be like if you took that money and invested that money into communities. What could you do? Now think about yourselves in terms of thinking about how you would distribute a budget. How could $767 million be spent elsewhere? And remember, that's just the custodial budget. I'm not giving you the justice. I'm not giving you all of the non-custodial sentencing. Uh, that occurs. People on home detention, people on intense supervision, people on community supervision, that's not costed in there. This is just the, that figure I give you is the custodial. So justice reinvestment looks at how we spend our money, how we appropriate it, where we put it in, and it rethinks that in terms of looking for uh, outcomes that are for justice, and really just outcomes. And justice in its broader sense, not divorced from the criminal aspect, for it, but much broader than that. Again, social harm is much broader than this very narrow conception of crime. It, 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 it's a much more looking at it at that really high level, structural level. So justice reinvestment is one area that I think we can do a lot of work in. We can do a huge amount of work in the zero to five space, uh, in terms of life course space. Um, some of the recommendations that have been made that uh, the expert advisory group was around uh, universal benefits in the first two years and then S so you put, you put a universal one right in the beginning. The research is very clear on this. The research is clear in terms of outcomes uh, next to universal benefits. Ideologically, people do not like universal benefits because they think, why should the rich benefit? fact is, in New Zealand, most people, when they're having children, the time they're having children, there's actually a very small segment in that zero to five. They're absolutely wealthy. But there are things you can do. You can make it universal right at the beginning, because that means you get complete buy-in. So you get 100% buy-in. And then you can sort of staircase it out. So you can means test it from whatever, wherever you determine. Six months, a year, two years. The research does sort of indicate you probably should go at least to 18 months, two years, keep it universal for that amount of time. Um, and that it does make the difference in terms of having more income, more support. But of course you do need much more, it's not just around the money, there is around the support funds. We have many families and whānau in New Zealand that don't have the support mechanisms in place. 
that, don't, that haven't had the types of role modelling that is often necessary to parent, you do need to invest in that area. The social sector trials in New Zealand, I think, uh, are areas that we can be, that we can have a very po positive uh, sort of appreciation of what, what has occurred there. So the social sector trials, first trialled with uh, six communities in New Zealand, Kawaro, Taikaroa, um, nearly all with with uh, high Māori populations within them, and they had five objectives that they needed to meet, all around youth, and you know, around truancy, around uh, youth offending. They had, they, they, things they had to meet, they were given, it was a reinvestment policy of a type, so they were given hundreds of thousands of dollars rather than millions of dollars, uh, and they, they gave it to the community and they said to the community to spend it in a way that they think would make the big difference. And particularly in some of those areas, the Tokoro really stands out um, as one of those areas where they actually cut the youth of, uh, offending rate by 75% during that time. Now the social sector trials have now extended to a number of other, a number of other places. This is the prison that I spend uh, quite a lot of time in. It's got the actual shape of it is supposed to be like uh, the stingray. So we use these uh, because it's on Tainui land right down by the airport, but that part of the airport, the airport's on Tainui land as well, and, Tainu, and the, the stingray is significant to the Tainui people. I could talk to you then about the incarceration of Māori culture, but I'll leave that for, <laughs> I'll leave that for another moment. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it was our newest prison until the, men, well, the men's prison will be opened next year, um, but this, is, this was a, the newest prison and a prison that was actually... Uh, for women prisoners, so it's supposed to be a little bit different in design. Um, those differences are quite are quite subtle. So social sector trials, justice reinvestment. Uh, those first five years of life, but we also have to reckon that there are other interventions that need. We know that particularly the 12 to 16 is a very significant area. Uh, we know that alcohol and drug. Um, I won't even go on around decriminalisation at the moment, but the fact is that it does criminalise an incredible amount of our young people. Um, and even though young and old partake, it's the criminalisation of the young and of marginalised groups that we actually see churning through the system. We do know that drug and alcohol treatment centre, the outcomes from drug and al alcohol treatment work much better outside of the wire than inside of the wire. If you're going to work on that issue, work on it outside of the wire, not in. Nafa Prison is another one. Um, this is the prison up north. In many ways, this is an interesting policy response because this was responding to the cry from Māori that their whānau, their, their kids, were too far from them. So we said, oh, that's good. We'll, put, you know, we'll, we'll respond to that. Of course, when they did respond to it, the, the, this particular iwi or the hapu there largely resisted it. Um, It's a site, a really important historical site for Māori, Ngāwha Prison. Uh, it was where one of, one of the chiefs held off the colonising army, made embankments nearly as high, actually, as that wall. And there is some terrible, terrible irony in the fact that this site was a site where Māori kept the coloniser out, and the same site now is a site where the settler state keeps Māori in. Um, it is nearly an entirely, nearly an entirely Māori uh, prison. Um, it's a place of the Tanifa as well, but you know what does the Tanifa tell us? The Tanifa tells us there are natural hazards. So people always, you know, go on about you know these mythical beasts, but the fact is why the Tanifa was in that area is because it's got very high subsidence, very high levels of flooding, and Nafa is sinking and it is breaking. Um, so there's some interesting things there around different ways of understanding cultural context as well. Are there things we can do? There are things we can do. There's ways that we can engage. Things like Just Speak, I think, is incredibly important and in that they are changing the conversation, that they're bringing in people from all young people to really interrogate, look at these issues and create change. What type of society do we want to live in? What type of society do we want our children to live in? What would it mean? You know. A very, this was probably the first election that didn't have actually crime and justice issue in the top three issues. 
And it was interesting to see that poverty, and particularly children's poverty, was in, was in those top issues, really for the first time uh, in many years. We need to reflect and reconsider about what we produce. And I think that we need to reflect and reconsider on our ability to create change. There are, I'm involved in a, in a trust called Waka, uh, Waka Moi Moia, the Dream Canoe, and its line in um, Te Reo Pākehā is being the change. And that trust is made up of both mongrel mob and black power leadership from across the country who recognise that they can know that they, that they need to be agents of their own change and so that they are actively working under very difficult conditions, both from within and without their communities, to create that level of change. They, they want to stop the intergenerational transfer of social inequalities. The three-strike law, if it had been in place when they were young men, would mean, and we've got people in the audience aware of this, if the three-strike law had been in place when they were young men, they would never get out. And so for them, they recognised that the three-strike law could be an extinguishing of whakapapa. That it will mean that our young men and our young women will never be released. And that is very significant to us. I've got two young women on strike two um, uh, that I work with now. One of them 24 one of them 21. The second strike, they both got the second strike in prison. So the first strike got out, the second strike they've actually got because of their ac actions in prison. So I'll leave, I'll leave that with you now and uh, I'm very open to questions. Modi order. Kia ora.